Let's see, I may. Okay. I thought, I don't know if this is showing up on the screen or not. I'll move it up so it's out of the way. Okay, so uh, like I said, chapter one and two. So chapter one, um, we we'll talk a little bit about the expanded privileges uh, that you get when you get your general license. Uh, do a little selling on reasons to upgrade from technician. Uh, but usually at this point, um, if you've decided to, to do the upgrade and you probably don't need to be sold on it. Um, requirements and uh, study materials for the general exam. They do a pretty good job of going through and explaining how to use the book and the questions. Uh, give you some ideas on how to prepare for your exam, uh, how to find an exam session, and where you can get more resources. Now, I'm not going to hit every one of these, but I just pulled out the things that I think might be of interest and uh, expand on them a, a little bit. Now, as it relates to the exam, um, we've got three people uh, doing this, and we had a date set for the exam. Um, and I th and then the Elk County um, Amateur Radio Club is also doing a test session the Saturday after the one we had scheduled on Sunday. So I thought since we've only got three and there's um, uh, too many, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing for them to come up to Treasure Lake and do this. They're always more than happy to do it. But I thought we would just go ahead and defer our exam to their regularly scheduled one, which will be in, um, um, well, it's not Brookville, it's um, Ridgeway. So we'll, we'll have the details uh, worked out on that a little later. So the uh, book gets into reasons to upgrade. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is that you have uh, privileges on more frequencies. Um, we'll get into what you had as a technician and what additional frequencies will be added. Uh, more communication options. Right now as a technician, you're not necessarily limited, but the most active area is um, FM operation on VHF and UHF. Uh, either simplex or uh, through a repeater. Um, new technical opportunities. Uh, one of the big differences is the because of the long, wider range of communication in terms of distance around the globe, there are a lot of uh, physical things that enter into how well, <coughs> excuse me, you can um, send and receive signals. And it was interesting today, uh, Judy and I went out on a parks uh, on the air activation in uh, Clear Creek uh, State Park and uh, band conditions were just horrible. She worked uh, for three hours and only made uh, 17 contacts. Whereas normally when she's, uh, we've got uh, decent uh, propagation conditions, she normally works 50 to 60 an hour. So, um, the, the propagation is a, a big part of um, going to the general class, um, and it really is an area you probably need to concentrate on uh, to, to really get a handle on uh, ham radio, at, uh, particularly the HF frequencies. And there's more fun. There's a, there's a lot of things you can do on the uh, bands that you'll be able to access. Uh, talk about rag chewing, which is con conversational contacts. You can do that on a repeater, but with this, you can do it with folks around the country or around the world, depending on uh, your uh, shack and, and uh, the propagation. Uh, there's a uh, activity called DXing, where you search for distant stations. Uh, there's uh, contesting, where you try to get um, as many contacts as you can uh, under a certain set of conditions. It's usually a weekend event. And um, then there are uh, nets, a lot of different kinds of nets where people get together and just talk about everything from how much grass they have to cut today uh, to all kinds of other topics. A lot of it's technical too. And just listening, you can pick up a, a lot of good information from that and some bad information once in a while. So you have to be a little careful with that. So a lot of good reasons to upgrade. 
Um, we looked at this chart in the uh, technician class, and this is the, uh, the band plan uh, showing the frequency privileges um, for the different class of licenses. A couple of things I wanted to point out here is that the frequencies in the red, band, the red box here are the frequencies that you have privileges to operate now uh, with your technician license. By going to general, it'll op uh, open up opportunities on all these other bands. And probably <coughs> the most used bands uh, would be typically 160 meters, 80, 40, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10. So right now you have uh, privileges on the 10 meter band. And the way this uh, um, is indicated here, is that uh, they're showing an N and a T. Uh, and what that is, N is a novice license, which is an older license that's no longer offered. Uh, it was the entry level license uh, some time ago. And then T is a technician. And then they'll talk about E, A, and G. And what that is, is the extra license, the advanced license, which is another legacy license, they're still valid, but they don't issue them anymore, um, and G for general. So let's say, for example, here on 40 meters, the way this reads is that if you're a general, for example, the green is um, phone and images, um, and then the red is RTTY and data and CW can, can operate there. And then the little squiggly boxes are CW only. So what you'd be looking at as a general on 40 meters is you would be able to operate phone, which is single sideband, and we'll get into that a little later, from 7.175 megahertz to 7.3 megahertz. And then you can operate these other modes RTT, Y, and data, and um, CW from 7 to 7.1 megahertz. And then you can see the advanced license can also operate in this section from uh, 7.1 to 7.175, uh, as can the extra. So essentially, what you're looking at is uh, privileges for most of the bands. Um, there are little gaps in there, <coughs> excuse me, that are, um, uh, actually my opinion is they put them there as an enticement to try to get the next uh, license level. Um, but I think in practicality, about the only thing I've seen where the, um, uh, the difference in this uh, between the general and the extra license in terms of frequency privileges comes into play when you're doing DX, uh, trying to contact foreign stations, because what happens in other countries, every country gets to set their own frequency requirements and uh, regulations. So typically a lot of the foreign countries that you're try trying to contact, the uh, foreign operators have the privilege to operate in what would be, say, this blank range for you. So you wouldn't be able to work uh, some of the, uh, the DX contacts. And uh, the, the ready solution for that, obviously, is to get the extra license. Uh, but everything else, most of the con uh, contests, uh, most of the uh, nets, most of the rag chewing occurs in the general section of each one of these bands. So, oh, one other note down here. These are continuous spectrum uh, frequencies. With one exception, 60 meters is different in that it has five channels that uh, can be used uh, by extras, advanced, and generals. Um, but it's only on these frequencies. It's frequency specific. Um, and it's also a secondary service or frequency for us in that there are other uh, license holders that are not ham operators that have priority on using these channels 
And if they come on, you have to defer and let them uh, take the frequency. So that's the one kind of oddball in there. Now, this is a spreadsheet I put together um, because that other one, I mean, it's got a lot of information on it. Uh, but what this one is, is I use the same color coding that they did, where green is the uh, the phone uh, or the voice frequencies, and red is the CW ready and data. And what it does, just at a glance, you can tell, for example, uh, today Judy was on 20 meters. Uh, she has a um, um, general license, and she was wanting to work a station at 14.227, uh, you should have been able to work that because it's upper sideband. Right. Anyway, it, if you look at this chart, it shows you exactly where the uh, limits are for your license. And then it also specifies the five channels on the, uh, the 60 uh, meter band. So this isn't a bad thing to print off and just have in your shack when you get to operating HF um, because I think we've got about 10 bands here and it's tough to remember uh, the limits on all the bands. I'm gonna pause the recording. Uh, this is a table right out of the book where they talk about the um, um, the testing that's required for the different licenses. Uh, for the technician, uh, you need element two. General, you need element three. Uh, both of them have uh, 35 questions uh, where it's, you have to get 26 correct to pass. And then amateur extra, uh, they designate as uh, element four and you need to get 38 out of 50 right. The reason these appear odd and, and there is no element one, <coughs> is that element one used to be the Morse code requirement. So rather than renumbering these, they just dropped element one, and that's why they talk about two, three, and four. Nothing major there, it's just a little note of explanation. Um, focusing on uh, high frequency and advanced modes, um, you know, the key here, and I always look at these licenses, not just to get the license so you can operate, but hopefully you'll learn the, uh, the practices and the procedures and how things work, uh, because an awful lot of the, your effectiveness uh, on using ham radio, particularly on HF, um, has to do with how well you understand what's going on and can adjust to uh, different conditions. So that's a, a real key for uh, going forward with your license. Uh, the other thing you'll have access to will be digital modes. Uh, these are keyboard to keyboard type um, modes of operation in that uh, rather than talking, you're typing and the receiving station sees what you're typing and when they type, they see what you're, uh, or you're seeing what they're typing. So it's a keyboard to keyboard uh, communication. Uh, Windmore is uh, um, a mode uh, program uh, for doing email without the internet. So with that, you can uh, do emails directly from one station to another or pass them through stations to get to uh, your addressed uh, family. <clears throat> There's Pactor, I'm not too familiar with that. And then probably the latest and greatest thing on digital modes in HF has been what's called the WSJT family, where there are modes like FT8 and FT4 that were developed for very low signal detection. Um, and that's, there's a lot of things, we'll have it uh, get into that a little bit later, uh, but that's a real new hot uh, topic for uh, HF. Um, now, the, the other thing or I mentioned earlier is solar effects on HF propagation. Um, we're coming out of uh, the minimum of uh, the solar cycle. Uh, when we got our licenses four years ago, we were in a solar minimum and propagation wasn't uh, uh, too great. But 
actually it turned out not to be a bad way to start because uh, we learned a lot about how to operate in, in poor conditions. Now we've got the solar cycle picking up. There'll be more uh, sunspots on the, uh, the sun. Uh, there'll be more energy and uh, mass ejected towards the earth and all those things have an impact on the uh, the radio waves um, primarily what it does to the ionosphere and for example tomorrow um, we're expecting to receive a it's called a moderate magnetic storm from a uh, coronal mass ejection on the sun i think it happened about wednesday and it takes a while it, it just belches a big blob of matter and it was aimed towards earth uh, so we're going to have uh, some interesting propagation tomorrow and i don't think interesting in a good way um, and the other thing that uh, uh, will happen is because the uh, um, the aurora because of the particles coming in the uh, aurora at the uh, north and south pole is going to be uh, quite a bit uh, brighter than it, than it normally is uh, we'll get into some test instruments, uh, such as an oscilloscope, uh, get into some practical electronic circuits. And if you haven't had any experience at that, that, that may uh, appear, appear a little daunting, but uh, we can get you through that. It's uh, uh, just basic, actually. We'll, we'll get through those things. And uh, more types of antennas. Right now, uh, typically, you're working with a... Uh, a vertical antenna on VHF and UHF, and there's just uh, tons of different types of antennas uh, for different conditions uh, that you can get into. If you have any questions, just stop me. That wouldn't be bad. <clears throat> so that was pretty much chapter one. Um, chapter two, uh, we start getting into a little more meat. We'll talk about basic HF operating procedures. Uh, some common uh, HF or high frequency practices and modes that are used. Uh, we'll get into how you receive and transmit on HF and then the digital operating on HF. Uh, we'll get into emergency communications and two uh, organizations that are involved with emergency communications is uh, ARIES, which stands for Amateur Radio Emergency Services. And it's affiliated with the ARRL, which is uh, a ham radio group, uh, kind of an industry uh, association. And then <coughs> there's also races. And I forget what that means. We'll probably see it on a slide later. Uh, but the distinction here is this organization is affiliated with federal and state agencies of either FEMA or Pima in Pennsylvania be um, Pennsylvania Emergency Management Association. So we'll show how that kind of stuff works. And uh, they had some distress calls in this chapter. So um, these are some of the different differences in, in HF operating, operating uh, than what you're doing with uh, your VHF, UHF uh, walkie talkie. It's not channelized um, except for 60 meters. So what that means, say if you're on a frequency of 7.250168, that's okay to operate there. I mean, that's just how um, it's, it's infinitely uh, adjustable through the whole band. Uh, you don't go on even steps um, from one, uh, frequency to another. On the other hand, it, typically what I've seen is that most of the HF um, contacts are made on frequencies like 7.250.0 or 7.2505. It's like 500 hertz steps. <coughs> so just out of normal practices, um, people have kind of lined up on um, uh, you know, just set frequencies, and then they move them at about 500 hertz a piece, and we'll take a look at that here a little bit later. As I mentioned earlier, one exception for that 60 meters, which is by design uh, channelized. 
typically um, there are calling frequencies on each band. And the idea with the calling frequency is the same thing we had with uh, VHF simplex and UHF simplex is that there are designated frequencies where you go to call CQ or to hunt for a CQ. And then once you make a contact, you change frequencies um, and continue with your conversation so you don't um, keep the calling frequency loaded. Um, the other thing uh, we have uh, that's your big difference on your radio is a variable frequency oscillator, and it's uh, referred to as a VFO, and that's typically on a large, uh, a large knob on an HF rig. And that's how you adjust the, uh, uh, the frequency. And you can also adjust it uh, by saving, say if you've got a certain frequency you want to go back to. Uh, you can save it in uh, the memory of the radio and then come back to that uh, pretty easily. And each radio does it a little differently, but it's uh, all the same concept. <coughs> So when you're calling CQ, uh, which means you want somebody to come back to you and, and start a discussion for some reason, uh, you find an open frequency. And the way you do that is you turn the variable frequency oscillator in the frequency range you'd like to operate. And when you don't hear anything, uh, you think that's an open frequency, then you have to check and make sure it's, it's open and nobody's on there. And, um, the way you do that is that uh, you just key your mic and say, is this frequency in use or is this frequency available? And then give your call sign and repeat that two or three times. And if you don't hear anybody come back, then it's a pretty good bet that that frequency is available and you can uh, start using it. And then once you've got your frequency um, into call to other hams to uh, come back to you, you call CQ, CQ, CQ. This is K3SKS. And typically, more so on HF than on the VHF, UHF, you give your call signs phonetically. So mine would be Kilo 3, Sierra, Kilo, Sierra. And the reason for that is, is if you're, you're gonna find that the HF bands are a little noisier, uh, the signals are a little weaker at times, and you can very easily miss a call sign uh, unless uh, the person announcing it is using the uh, phonetic alphabet. And then um, you can CQ for DX, distance stations, uh, contests, special events. Uh, the Florida QSO party was going on today. And so there were a lot of stations uh, in Florida on the air trying to get contacts um, in that contest. So uh, there's always a lot of different things going on on the airwaves and there's a lot of tools you can use to find out what's going on when. And then there are other things called, another thing is called a special event. And a lot of times those are historic, uh, although they don't have to be, but what it is, they'll set up a special event station somewhere. And uh, an example of that is that uh, the Punxsutawney uh, Amateur Radio Club um, every year on um, Groundhog Day, or actually several days after Groundhog Day, they operate a special event station where um, you call, they'll call CQ, you call in and make contact with them, and then you can send them a request for a certificate um, or a card of some sort. So there are just all kinds of things you can do. And then, um, Let's say um, you're listening to a discussion between two hands and they're going back and forth. And you run into this also on VHF and UHF with the repeaters. Um, say if you'd like to break in and, and offer some of your input on whatever the topic might be, uh, what you want to do is to, uh, uh, during a pause, just give your call sign. Um, or I've heard people say contact. That's an indication you'd like to make contact with them. And they'll do uh, one of two things. Uh, they'll either acknowledge uh, your request to join them or they'll ignore it. 
usually they acknowledge it because uh, uh, hams are generally pretty friendly. <coughs> so what you do is wait for the station to come back to you, and then you can enter into the conversation with them. Uh, then selecting a frequency, you know, one question you might have is, what do you do with all these bands? Well, the, the physics of each band is different uh, because the frequencies are different. And what that does is you kind of have some general uh, areas you would go to depending on what you're wanting to do. Uh, short range and regional, uh, let's say Pennsylvania and the adjoining states, let's call that regional. Um, you ought to be able to work that if conditions are reasonable on both 80 meters and 40 meters. Sometimes you can get farther than that, um, but generally uh, when the bands are halfway decent, uh, you can contact uh, uh, hams in that, that region on either one of these bands. And sometimes one will be better than the other. Uh, longer range um, is uh, 30 meters, which is a digital band, to 10 meters. And this is where the solar conditions come in because these frequencies rely heavily on the bounce off of the ionosphere. So what the sun's doing up there is it's causing variation in the ionosphere. So the propagation is going to vary from day to day, hour to hour, sometimes minute to minute. And it's learning what's going on there to figure out what band would be uh, the, the best to use for uh, communications you're trying to have. Now today it was horrible. Uh, no matter what band we went to, um, we just weren't finding good conditions. Uh, the other thing you need to uh, make sure you do, um, and uh, probably everybody makes this mistake uh, at least once, is know your class privileges on the band. Um, because what happens is you, you're announcing your call sign, and there are web pages that. Uh, we all use where you can put someone's call sign in and your FCC license pops up immediately and they can see if you're a general or an extra or technician or even if you don't have a license. And uh, you'll say if you wander off into the extra band and they'll make a contact and announce your call sign, I've heard guys, you will come back at them uh, and they're not mean about it, they just, uh, remind them that they're in the wrong spot and they ought to get back up in the general band. So that's just an awareness of uh, where you're at uh, compared to what your privileges are. And then this is that, I'm not sure why I put two of these in, I guess in case you lose one. <clears throat> one other thing you need to consider uh, when you're selecting a frequency is uh, what mode you're gonna be using. Um, and then that tells you what basic area in that band you're gonna be operating. And then the other factor that comes into uh, consideration is the signal separation between signals. And I think I've got some uh, band scope plots next that'll explain this a little better. Uh, but for CW, uh, the Morse code mode, uh, you generally want to keep 150 to 500 hertz apart. And the reason for that is, is uh, CW is a very narrow band mode. Uh, it may only be 50 to 100 uh, hertz wide, whereas a uh, single sideband signal, like you can see on the next line, is two and a half to three kilohertz wide. So that, that could be... Uh, um, quite a bit difference uh, between the, the bandwidth of both, of both of those with CW being very narrow. So you can have more CW uh, conversations going on in the normal space it would take to do a single sideband. So if the single sideband is two and a half kilohertz and just making sure um, um, we want 150 hertz between conversations, I can't do that math in my head, but you know, 10, 15 uh, CW conversations can take up the same amount of bandwidth as one single side band. Uh, RITTY, R-T-T-Y, uh, is another digital mode, uh, fairly narrow bandwidth. Uh, so the recommended signal separation 
is 250 to 500 hertz. And PSK31, which is a, a very popular digital mode, is also very narrow. And uh, it's recommended you keep 150 to 500 uh, hertz separation. And that, that'll make more sense when we take a look at the a band scope. So in summary, choosing a frequency simple. Be sure the frequency is authorized to general class licensees. Follow the band, band plan under normal circumstances and listen to the frequency to avoid interfering with ongoing communications. Um, so um, the other thing you can find on um, the HF bands or nets where it's kind of like our Monday night net, uh, but they do it on HF. You may have people from all over the country uh, participating. Uh, this is an example of one program that's available, a free program <clears throat> called NetLogger. And all you have to do is uh, Google NetLogger and uh, download and install the program. And what you're able to do then is to see the nets that are being used by NetLogger. Not all nets use NetLogger, but this is a, a way to find nets on uh, the HF bands. And you can see, for example, here, um, these uh, call signs have checked into the net, uh, the state of where they're from. You can see they're spread out. These look to be primarily Midwest. Uh, in the uh, city. Uh, but it's just a, a good way to see who's on the air, uh, what nets are currently going on. Because there are nets 24 hours a day. You can always find a net of some sort. That's just one of the, the tools that they have. And typically, the nets are the same time, uh, usually every day. And there are nets that have uh, been going on for 40, 50 years uh, at the same time of the day, same frequency, and uh, they just keep uh, having contacts and uh, net discussions. Uh, this is out of your book too, and it's just the typical HF band plan for 20 meters. The, the thing, one thing I like about ham radio is that this uh, breakdown of where you operate on the bands <coughs> isn't uh, required by the FCC. It's not a law or any directive or anything like that from the FCC. What it is, it's uh, generally accepted practices that have been developed over the years amongst the hams on kind of a voluntary basis uh, to come up with these uh, frequency allocations. For example, if you want to do PSK31, uh, you want to go to 14.070 uh, megahertz on uh, uh, 20 meters. And that's where most, you operate PSK31 uh, the most and then all the different things you might want to do. They, they're targeted uh, frequencies to make it easy uh, to say, for example, if you want to do QRP, which is a low power uh, operating uh, mode uh, where you, you may only be operating with five or 10 watts, uh, you would want to go to this frequency and see if you can make contacts with other QRPers. And this is the uh, from the ARRL Consider it Operators Frequency Guide, and it just gives you the information of the frequencies for each band. So this this one is uh, 160, 160 meters, 80 meters. Uh, here's 40 meters, and each of the HF bands are uh, they kind of show you where uh, most of the work is being done on those frequency ranges. Any questions on any of this so far? Probably yeah. Okay, I'll keep going. Ah, now we're getting to some good stuff. This is um, a screenshot of a program that I used uh, called HDSDR. And what it is, it's a uh, program that you can use with your HF radio. And for this setup, I also used a, an SDR, which is a software-defined radio 
It takes the same antenna signal that my HF rig uses, and it generates the frequency spectrum uh, to show all the signals. In uh, in this case, uh, this would be 40 meters. So if you recall, 40 meters runs from 7.000 to 7040080. Better put my glasses on. No, there's 7.080. Um, all the way to the upper end of the band at 7.3 megahertz. And the way this is divided is that the phone session section goes from 7.125 to 7.3. And that's further divided in that this section here is for amateur extra only from 7.125 to I think at 7.175. So in order to work these signals, you would have to have an extra license. A general uh, can work all these signals here. Now, when I say there's signals, what it is is here's a strong signal right here. And, and we'll see a little bit later when we look at the, the radio live uh, what happens. <coughs> but the magnitude of the signal changes with uh, the speaker's voice. You know, as he as he gets a stronger, uh, louder uh, word, um, this will get bigger, and then it'll modulate up and down with with his voice. So this is the real time spectrum of what's actually going on on the band. What's down here is what's called a waterfall. And it is a sample of the magnitude of this signal at different points in time. So that if this were running, you'd be seeing the magnitude of the signal changing and this waterfall running down this way and putting new signals on the waterfall. So you can kind of see uh, how the signal has been. This one's kind of interesting here. Um, it's a very strong signal, very strong signal here and a weaker signal in between. And typically what that is, that's a strong station. Uh, uh, probably someone with a, a big uh, directional antenna and a 1500 watt amplifier. Uh, and he's just boomer, I call them big boomers. And then He's talking to someone that may only be a 100 watt amplifier in his HF rig, and that's why the signal is weaker <coughs> between the, uh, um, the the big boomers uh, uh, contact. Uh, the other thing to note is that this is lower sideband. It says that here somewhere. Yeah, right here, lower sideband, and what that means is that the carrier frequency is here and then the signal is below that. Now if we go to 20 meters it'll be upper side band and it'll be just the opposite. The one thing that's kind of neat about uh, this type of uh, display is that it's typically set up so all you have to do is click here on the um, uh, carrier frequency on uh, 40 meters upper side band it would be the right side of that display and it'll automatically switch your radio to that frequency, which is kind of neat if you're wanting to go through and see who's talking about what. Now down here is the uh, digital and CW section. And what you can see here is uh, FT8. Uh, that's one of the WSJT modes that I mentioned that's uh, very popular now. And this uh, bandwidth here, uh, this represents, you know, hundreds of uh, signals, uh, hundreds of different conversations in a very small band, uh, frequency band. Uh, so that kind of has a kind of char char characteristic look to it. And then over here on the, the lower side of that uh, digital CW section, are the CW signals. And you can see that they're very narrow in terms of frequency. And uh, you can see the dits and daws as they're uh, going through. So a lot of times you can tell what kind of signal it is just by the waterfall look or the, the frequency display. 
And then what's down here um, is a display of the audio frequency, uh, the voice uh, that you're listening to. And you'll see this change as the, um, uh, the person speaking speaks. So a lot of information there. Uh, a lot of the newer radios have this type of information uh, built into them. And we'll take a look here in a minute at one that does. Uh, the other thing that's uh, pretty important is a logbook. Uh, you need to, uh, or you should keep a logbook of your contacts. And uh, you can do it a lot of different ways. You can do it by paper. Uh, you can do it uh, digitally. There are logbook programs uh, that give you a lot of uh, capabilities of uh, managing and uh, analyzing the data. You can do it online. Uh, there are web pages that you can maintain your log. One good example is QRZ.com, uh, but it, it's just a good discipline to uh, develop uh, when you start uh, doing this. Um, there's interference, uh, two different types, uh, main types of interference. Uh, one's referred to as QRM, and the M means it's man-made. Uh, it's a uh, Harmful, but not always illegal. And I'll give you an example. Let's go back to that frequency uh, spectrum. Um, let's say this guy here is uh, real close to this guy here. Say uh, he's a couple kilohertz above. So you can see how wide his signal is. If he doesn't have sufficient spacing away from this signal, then his signal is going to interfere with this fellow's signal. Um, and that's uh, one of the more common uh, causes of QRM is just inadequate uh, spacing uh, between the uh, frequencies. If um, you hear that quite a bit, um, particularly when uh, the bands get pretty busy. And it's not always illegal, it is. Uh, uh, kind of rude though, and uh, usually you can ask someone if they could uh, move a little bit, and uh, the Q code for moving uh, frequency or changing frequency is QSY, so if you have run into where you're picking up uh, the edge of someone's uh, conversation, uh, you can just dial up to the frequency they're on, ask them if they could go up uh, one kilohertz or, or so, and uh, hopefully they'd be able to do that. I'm not sure why I've got two of these in here, because uh, I think this is a duplicate of the last slide we took a look at. <clears throat> I really don't think I have anything else to point out on that. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting is with these uh, frequency displays, the band scopes, um, the waterfall can show you a lot of noise uh, uh, patterns. And this is one that I had I haven't seen this for a while, um, but I was getting periodic noise um, on 40 meters, which is what this band is, and they were 50 kilohertz apart. You get these, see these uh, noise signals here? They kind of duplicated themselves every 50 kilohertz. Never was able to figure out what that was, but there would be times I'd be uh, working along and things are fine, and then it's like somebody threw a switch and this noise started. So someone around here, it might have even been me, had something that was starting up to introduce the noise. And uh, that's a whole nother endeavor there trying to track down noise sources like that. Now I'm gonna do a live demo of an HF rig to just give you an idea about it. Um, what we're gonna be looking at is a Kenwood TS-890S and the reason I'm using that is that's my base radio. And it has a feature where I have a program <coughs> that I can operate the radio from a computer on my local area network. It can also operate my radio from anywhere in the world using the internet, uh, but I haven't got that up and running yet, but I can do it from my uh, home computers. So uh, we're going to take a look and see if we can find things uh, on the band scope 
We'll look at single sideband signals, some CW signals, and some digital. So I'm going to pause the PowerPoint and minimize that. And this program, by the way, from Kenwood was um, free uh, to go along with the radio. Um, you know, things usually boil down to you get what you pay for. And uh, some of the uh, radio companies expect you to buy this kind of software. Kenwood charges a little more maybe, uh, but they include this kind of stuff as uh, uh, freeware. So what I'm doing now, I'm going to connect to the radio and wait for this message. And now there's the welcome message. And I'm going to turn on the band scope. Okay, now I got to move some things around on my desk here. Okay, so. This is what's actually happening right now on 40 meters. You can see we're at 7.18. This is actually 7.175 to 7.3 megahertz. This is the general band for single sideband. So what we're looking at here are these signals up here. Let's see, let's get on a signal so you can hear it. I'm going to click right here on the uh, this signal because it's a pretty strong signal. And you can hear them. So you can see the magnitude of this spike here is changing as his voice changes. And this is like a strip chart recorder showing you there he paused, so there's no signal. Okay. Okay. Uh, so here's a, a lighter signal. You can see the magnitude of the, uh, the band scope isn't as great. And the, got to tune it a little bit there. So this is a little weaker signal. Uh, but you can still see um, the magnitude and uh, the history of the signal. So that's showing you what's going on right now on uh, 40 meters, and you can tune to any of these uh, frequencies and hear what's going on. Now, if you wanted to get on a call uh, CQ, you can see with this, this might be a good area to look for a frequency because there aren't um, uh, many things going on or anything you can really see. So what you would do is click in there, you don't hear anything, and then you would uh, ask, is this frequency available? K3SKS. Do that a couple of times. And then if it, uh, nobody comes back to you, then you can start using that frequency. So this is what the single sideband uh, section looks like. Let me go. Let's see. Okay, I just switched it here. Okay, this is the section of the band for PSK31. Okay, this is where PSK31 is at this frequency. 7.070, if you remember from uh, what we looked at on that sheet earlier. And you can see right now, I'm going to zoom in so that this center frequency is in the center of the screen and we're going to zoom in to see what's going on right here. So so this is our center frequency and you can see there aren't any signals there. They would be north or to the right of uh, the 7.070. Now what we do have is if I go to um, the frequencies here, 
this is where the PSK31, or not, excuse me, not PSK31, the FT8 operates. So let me. So I'm dialing up now to 7.040. And you can see all these uh, digital signals that are being sent and received on FT8. Now FT8's uh, got a sent cycle that it goes through of about 15 seconds, uh, where for 15 seconds, one station transmits, pauses, and then the next 15 seconds, the receiving station transmits back. So they kind of go back and forth. Uh, uh, with their uh, transmitting, and we'll take a look at that uh, in a little more detail in one of the later sessions. So that's what a uh, very uh, used digital mode looks like on a band scope. So let me go back to the main scope. Let's see, there's my buttons. Okay, now we're back to, uh, this is the CW, RTTY, and digital section of 40 meters from 7.0 to 7.125. And this is the FT8 we were just looking at. And what we're seeing here are CW signals. So let me tune in on the one here. And I'm going to change the mode to CW. And we'll zoom in, see if we can. Uh... Okay, so now we've zoomed in to that same frequency that we tuned to. And here's the signal that we're hearing. And you can see how narrow a CW signal is uh, compared to single sideband. Single sideband signal here to here. Uh, would be about two, yeah, well, let me make it, here's uh, two kilohertz. So single sideband signal would take up about this much space here, two to, two to three uh, kilohertz. And here's another, so all these are CW signals going on. Okay, so that's just a look at the different types of signals in real time. Any questions? Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, fire the PowerPoint back up. Let's go ahead and do that. And this first thing I need to do is quiet this down. So I'll disconnect from the radio. But the thing that's pretty neat about this program is that everything that I can do with the knobs and buttons on the radio, I can do with this screen. So it's uh, pretty handy. Okay. Talked a little bit about CW. This is just a. Um, table of the codes for CW. And uh, these are the, the modes um, of uh, lower sideband, upper sideband, and AM. And I think we covered this a little bit um, in the technician course, uh, but we'll come back and review it because now it's gonna have a little more impact on uh, operating on the HF bands. So what this is, if you take a signal that is amplitude modulated, that's where we uh, take a base frequency carrier wave and impose the voice signal on the amplitude of that carrier wave, uh, we get an amplitude modulated signal. And if we were to look at that signal, that's a signal in time, if we were to convert that to a frequency plot, 
what we would see <coughs> is that we would have a center frequency called the carrier frequency, and that would be the frequency of the carrier um, or the dial frequency is another way to look at it. And there are two side bands. There's a lower side band and an upper side band. And both of these side bands contain identical information, which is the, um, uh, the voice signal. Uh, hold on just a second. Okay, I'm back. So both of these side bands contain the same information, which is the audio envelope of the signal that's coming from the microphone. So if you transmit an AM signal, if, say for example, 1420 in our area is an AM radio station, they transmit a carrier signal and, a lower, and it also has the lower side band and the upper side band. Uh, you can also operate this mode in ham radio, and it was primarily uh, more prevalent uh, back uh, many years ago uh, when the electronics weren't quite as good uh, to do uh, single sideband. So they would and still do transmit uh, a carrier signal with the lower and upper sideband. And a lot of the people that operate AM uh, modes on the ham frequency uh, or HF bands that are hams are doing it with uh, legacy equipment, the older equipment with tubes and things like that. Now, um, so the frequency that's required to do an AM signal is about half of it's uh, three kilohertz here, three kilohertz here, so the whole bandwidth is six kilohertz. Now what we're doing with um, lower sideband or upper sideband transmissions is that we are stripping the carrier out and ignoring one of the sidebands and only transmitting one of the sidebands. And what that does is it cuts the carrier requirements of frequency in half uh, because uh, one of the sidebands is typically uh, two and a half to three kilohertz. And this is what you saw on that screen um, with the, uh, the spikes on the, uh, the top graph. Um, the sideband is what you were seeing because the carrier wasn't there, nor the other sideband. So that'll make a little more sense as we get into it too. So let's go ahead and uh, get the slide started again. <coughs> okay, now we're gonna switch to uh, digital modes. And there are two, um, I don't know what you would call them, realms of digital operation in ham radio, at least two. Uh, one of them you're familiar with, uh, if you're using your technician license to operate DMR, uh, D-Star, uh, System Fusion from Yezu, uh, and there's probably a couple others where uh, they are taking the analog signal that would normally go, would be transmitted as an FM signal, uh, an analog, convert it to a digital signal, and then transmit the digital uh, signal. Receive the digital signal at the other end and then decode it um, so you get the voice back. The other type of um, digital that you'll encounter in, in ham radio is the use of keyboard to keyboard type modes and they are very similar actually they're identical uh, in concept to what you have in a normal computer uh, and network so kind of the general solution for a couple of computers tied on a network whether it's a local area network or the internet is that one person one station is the sender and whatever data is to be sent is converted to serial data of ones and zeros and then there is an encoder that takes those ones and zeros and makes it uh, compatible with how you're gonna transmit the information over the local area network or the internet or whatever this connection is. Then there's a decoder that uh, is the same 
uh, mode is the encoder that'll take this digital signal if it's coming from the internet, decode it back into the ones and zeros. So this receiver receives the same data that was sent from this one. So that's kind of the general solution of a digital data transfer, um, whether it be a local area network, uh, the internet, or even uh, ham radio. And uh, the way to look at it from uh, digital and ham radio is there's a couple of different, the two different types of digital is where there's a fellow talking to a repeater. Um, the audio is converted to a digital signal that's transmitted by radio waves to another repeater. And then the decoder here in the radio converts it back to the ones and zeros so they hear the voice. Um, you can also do voice um, over the internet. VOIP means voice over internet protocol. And uh, that can be done uh, here through the internet. You can also take digital data, let's say text, and transmit it uh, from an antenna through the radio waves to another station that can receive and decode it. <coughs> and they go back and forth that way. So uh, the mode is essentially how the signal is encoded and decoded. That determines the mode. And when we talk about different modes, for example, PSK31 has encoder and decoder protocols. Uh, FT8 has different encoder and decoder protocols. <coughs> but the point is both stations have to be on the same page. Uh, you really can't take an FT8 signal and decode it with a PSK31 uh, program. Uh, this is out of the book, uh, just some summary information on the different types of uh, modes. <coughs> We're looking here at CW, AM, amplitude modulation, single sideband, what the bandwidth requirements are, some of the digital modes. Um, and I don't think there's anything you want to memorize, but uh, you'll eventually get uh, a good feel, particularly you'll become very familiar with those modes that you are going to be using. Okay, wanted to show you an HF transceiver. Um, this is a Kenwood TS590SG. It's one of the three, what I would consider, um, depending on what you're wanting to do, a good candidate for an entry level HF transceiver for a new hand. Uh, this is the one I bought, uh, and it's the radio I used to generate those band scope uh, plus we had earlier, but it was a little more involved uh, getting that set up than just buying one of the uh, radios that has the band scope built into it. But there's trade offs on it. So, one thing you'll notice right away the difference between a VHF UH radio and an HF radio transceiver is uh, the complexity. There's quite a few more buttons. Uh, displays bigger, more information on the display, a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, so we'll just kind of break it down into some little bites here. So what I did here, uh, I'm just showing the um, buttons that would be used and the knobs that would be used for HF receiving. So this is listening to um, the signal coming in. And uh, I'll just point out some of the keys here. I mean, there's a lot going on. It's too early to really get into it. But you can see here, for example, these are called the mode switches, where I can switch from lower sideband to upper sideband if I'm uh, doing single sideband, depending on which band I'm on. You see here, 14.200, that's uh, 20 meters, and 20 meters is an upper sideband uh, convention uh, for transmitting and receiving. Most of the radios, when you go to that band, it'll automatically adjust the mode to upper sideband. Then here's um, CW and FSK, which is frequency shift keying, uh, to digital mode. CW is a digital mode. Uh, if you're running AM or FM, uh, you make that selection here. 
and if you're running data here. This is just a numeric keyboard. You can see the blue numbers. Uh, way you would enter a frequency numerically, you'd hit the enter button and then punch the blue numbers to come up with the frequency you want. These buttons are uh, band buttons where if you press 3.5, that is 80 meters. So it'll take you immediately to 80 meters and it'll set uh, the mode to lower sideband. Um, over here are different um, buttons used to control the two variable frequency oscillators in the radio. And that's uh, down the road quite a bit before we get into that, but that's what these buttons are for. And uh, these are recorder buttons. Uh, this radio with an option added, you can record uh, voice that you uh, enter um, or uh, sound that you receive and a lot of other things that uh, this is primarily antenna stuff up here. So that's the uh, uh, what you would use uh, to control the HF receiving and then going to HF transmitting. Um, you look here and uh, select which antenna you're using. Uh, there are pre-amplifiers that you can um, introduce uh, into the signal path. Uh, you can tune uh, the antenna tuner. Uh, this is a microphone button, uh, adjust the power. Uh, CW control here, modes again, and then this is uh, controls for this variable frequency oscillator. So it's, it's a little more complex, but as you get into it, you get the feel for it, okay? So a couple of things to note on uh, the phone modes, um, when you're transmitting on single sideband or um, AM, is that uh, you, just as you have with your VHF, UHF radio, uh, the hand mic has a press to talk button on it. When you want to talk, um, you just press it, um, give it a little pause before you start speaking, and a little pause to release after you're done speaking. Uh, same thing as you have on your uh, HT or um, VHF, UHF radio. Then there's a, mo a, a condition where you can uh, set it up for voice operated transmit or Vox. And what that does is uh, it enables you not to have to push the press to talk, but your voice actuates uh, the press to talk. Uh, so as, as soon as the system hears you start to speak, it'll engage the uh, press to talk function and you'll start transmitting and it'll continue to transmit until it doesn't hear your voice. <coughs> Those things aren't without issues. And just from my personal experience, I've never found the need to do that. Uh, some procedures and abbreviations. Uh, call sign every 10 minutes, just like you need to do with VHF and UHF, and also close with your call sign at the end of the QSO. And then uh, Q signals and phonetic alphabet, uh, we covered that in the technician. <clears throat> this is a um, table of different Q signals. Um, and you know, you're probably not gonna use all of them, but some of them you'll start becoming uh, familiar with. Like right here is QRM and QRN. That has to do with the man-made natural noise. Uh, let's see. QRT means to stop sending or you're shutting down uh, your shack. Uh, let's see. QRZ. Who, uh, you're being called by whom? Uh, it's a, a question. A lot of times in a contest, somebody will call CQ, CQ, K3, SKS, PA, uh, QSO party, CQ. And uh, when he just finishes a contact, rather than going through all that again, they'll just say QRZ. And that means that I'm ready for the next guy. Uh, so that's... Uh, one you'll use a QSO is um, communication with someone. QSY, change to transmission, change the transmission uh, to another frequency. And then here's the 
uh, phonetic alphabet. Uh, on CW, there are two types of uh, keys. Uh, one you'll hear referred to as a straight key. This is like the, uh, the old time uh, telegraph key where you push the lever down and it'll uh, close for however long you hold it and generate the tone. And the width of the tone determines whether it's a dip or a dot. The, there are paddle keys uh, where if you hit one side, uh, it generates a dip. And you hit the other side, it generates a da. So if you wanted to send the letter A, you'd hit this one and then this one. So go da da. Um, so there's, there's also ways you can do that with a computer, but we'll get into that later. Okay, this just shows the structure of a call, a CQ call uh, for uh, digital or Morse code. This is a link that gives you more details on it. Uh, the emergency operation, uh, amateur radio emergency service is ARIES. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, program uh, managed by ARRL and it serves the agencies of the Red Cross Salvation Army much, oh, National Weather Service and others. So the concept here is that hams go into these organizations during time of emergency and uh, perform communication functions uh, for these uh, served agencies. RACES, uh, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services, that's the one I couldn't remember earlier. And it's sponsored by FEMA <coughs> on the federal level and uh, PEMA, Pennsylvania Emergency Management Association, on the uh, state level. And they're primarily, from what I've seen, concerned with gathering information from the field, uh, providing input to uh, the emergency management uh, organization that's. Uh, uh, taking care of a particular emergency. And Treasure Lake Ham Group. Our uh, mission is a little different. Um, this is uh, set up to serve these agencies. The ARIES is. Uh, RACES is set up to provide information to a government agency, FEMA and PEMA. And our Ham Group has been set up to provide information to our local community. And uh, this is how it works. Uh, we probably uh, covered this in the technician section or you've seen it somewhere else. But essentially the, the heart of our local uh, amateur radio communications is our UHF repeater that's located in Treasure Lake Church. The idea there is that we wanted to be able for all the hams in uh, Treasure Lake and the surrounding area to be able to communicate using uh, mobile base radios like these or HTs like these. And that's why we put in the 40 watt repeater uh, so that the HTs can generally communicate with everybody else. And you couldn't do it with Simplex because of the geography and uh, these uh, handhelds just didn't have enough power or range with the antenna. So that's how the local communication within and around our community is set up. Uh, we also have uh, provided people that uh, wanted to buy them um, ham radio HT uh, devices that you can't transmit, but you can receive. So that uh, people that don't have a ham license can at least hear what's going on. So, we're looking at uh, providing communication within the community. And then the, uh, we have a number of uh, hams that have HF stations that are capable of communicating uh, regionally, state, nationally, and worldwide so that any information out there could be passed back into the community. So that's kind of how the, uh, the whole um, concept, the basic concept of communications and uh, 
Treasure Lake as it comes to, uh, related to ham radio. And with all these different uh, services, uh, here's Aries, for example, races. Uh, you need to know what frequencies that they operate on. So this is a table of um, where the emergency frequencies are uh, for Aries functions here. Um, also races, the uh, group that's associated with Pima. Saturn is a Salvation Army emergency group. And then the TLSC are the uh, frequencies used for the Treasure Lake Sportsman's Club. Um, here's our repeater. Um, these are the simplex frequencies we use. Um, so these can be programmed into your radios. And then we also have some operating frequencies um, on 10 meters um, on HF. And the, the reason um, that we put them here uh, if you remember, the technician has single sideband privileges on 10 meters from 28.300 to 28.500 megahertz. So we selected frequencies within that range, uh, designate them as emergency frequencies for local communications on 10 meters. So that way, a technician, if he has a, uh, an HF radio, would be able to communicate. So this is a uh, good information to keep handy. Um, and we do have um, an emergency net uh, process we go through if there is an emergency and some of these frequencies are assigned to uh, different operators to monitor and report back to the group. And that's it, that's all I know. Um, so Travis, you got any questions if I haven't put you to sleep? Um, no, I think I'm good. Okay. You didn't doze off too many times, did you? No, this was actually the more entertaining of the three classes I took today. Oh, okay. What else were you taking? I'm going to stop the uh, recording. Well, give me a second here.